everyone, Amarathi here, and we finally have the 085 patch notes, so let's get into them and see what they're all about. Um, it is a bit of a light of patch than uh, previous patches. We knew that going into it. We knew there wasn't any real big features of this patch. It was just kind of a get some content in the game, do some skill adjustment, do some bug adjustment kind of deal. And that has been mostly what we've got. There are some features I'm really excited for, which is like the, the new dungeons and the uh, the new arena champions. Um, but outside of that, I think it's a good, healthy patch. And I, it's also good that not every patch is this big grandoise patch that we've had for, I think, um, like 084 and 083 being so big. So yeah, look, it's good. It's healthy. Uh, let's get into it. So uh, dungeon, the Soulfire Bastion. Uh, this is basically just go in there, kill as many things as you can. Try and collect your soul embers, and then you can spend those soul embers on the soul gambler, which uh, I believe is like, um, you know, you you pick your base type, and but it's like a unidentified item essentially. Um, I think Path of Exile has something similar to this. I'm not sure, uh, but look, it's a cool system. It's good. I, I think it'll be an interesting dungeon. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the Lightless Arbor, on the other hand, uh, we've, we've seen a bit of footage of this, and this is an awesome gold sink. So now we have something useful for gold that isn't just stash stamps. Um, this will be the main thing that we want to put in gold sink. I'm not sure if we necessarily want to um, do this as like smaller gold hits more frequently, or just like save up like 4 million five million gold and then just like spend as much as you can right um so that that'll be determined we'll we'll do some science on that and work out what probably the the most optimal route is but basically you know you do the dungeon and then um you'll go into the vault of uncertain fate where you can choose some modifier on your reward chest and the more modifiers you choose is going to make it more expensive you can also like decline to use some of those modifiers uh which will make the like other one, uh, so the next appearing option, more expensive. Um, all, all I know is that you really do just want to spend like a lot of money on this at a time. Um, you want to be looking to max out those 11 mods because they're, it's multiplicative, right? Um, so you're getting a lot more value overall. All right, Arena of Champions looks really cool. Um, it sounds like uh, there is... We've got four tiers, right? And I think it's like every thirty waves, we we'll have like you have a choice to select a a modifier, and you'll do that like three times, and then at the culmination of that, at arena wave ninety, you'll you'll face one of the champions in their specific arena. Um, so you see here in the Majassa kind of tile set that you're versing a rogue, um, and then there's like a primeless one, uh that had more of a like elemental tile set. And then uh, the forge master one was like in a blacksmithing forge that looked kind of like the, uh, um, you know, Diablo three butcher arena or, or something like that. Right. So this is really cool. Um, when I first saw this, I thought the endless arena mode would also be applicable to this style of gameplay, but it's not, it's actually, this is basically just like a dungeon that's, set in the format of arena waves i want to see the difficulty of the tier four stuff because the tier four stuff could be a good candidate for future leaderboards or competitive tournaments or something like that i don't know um but yeah look i, I think it'll be awesome um okay so let's let's get into it uh i'm not going to go through all of this i really just want to point out the stuff that is going to be influencing the meta um stuff that you know we're no longer going to be looking at these skills or items as much as they were, but we might want to look at this stuff. So I'm not just going to go through everything. I'm just going to pull out what is important. Um, I think Puncture getting this little thing here makes it a much better mana generator than it previously was. So this is really good for rogues in general. Um, it, it feels kind of bad that you have to just use Flurry because of its insane attack speed if you want to use a zero cost mana generator with um, sapping strikes. So I think this puts puncture in a better spot as well as allowing you to get your bleeding fury buff up much quicker if you are going for that increased bleed chance. 
Um, I'm interested in the Rip Blood, uh, what they have here, but I, I'm not expecting too much of it. Um, Static could be very interesting. I, I'm keen to see this. There, there's a bunch of ways to generate a lot of static, so Static Orb is very good for it. Um, and then you can do it through like regular Spellblade things. You can do it through Surge. Um, but the like with the Static Orb, right, both the initial hit and the minor orbs can all proc the Static Orb charges per enemy hit. So with one enemy, right, I think you can get like eight stacks of st oh, so eight Static charges per hit. And there's like five, because um, you've got the main ball and then the four small balls with static orb, allowing you to get 40 static charges per cast per hit of an enemy. So if you're hitting like five targets, one static orb can get you 200 static charges, making it kind of pretty interesting. The only thing is that static charge, so static, the ability and the discharge still has a, um, a bug where if you look at the node that increases the mana cost per static charge but also gives you flat per static charge uh that is bugged it'll steal your mana but it won't give you the flat uh and i think that's a big limiting factor in, in the strength of the build um swarm blade stuff really is just like locusts are a lot better quality of life and locust swarm is, sorry, not, not so much quality of life, um, but they're a lot stronger and they may be strong enough to actually be strong enough on their own, like actually using like a locust build and, and having like 40 plus locusts or whatever. Um, the, the locust swarm, the locust swarm can do damage, but the problem is that it's such a clunky, awkward playstyle that you just, it's not worth buying. I've, I've had a build like, in the background ready to go if they do some like good quality of life changes but it's really just not there um so we'll see how we go right and you know we we could get something but i'm not expecting much but what i am expecting is minion damage locust to kind of be a thing i'm not sure if it's going to be poison crit or something else uh, usually poison or crit are the way to go for those things but we'll find out right um Some campaign stuff there. We've got some new catalysts. That might be pretty good, pretty healthy. So I've changed the meta up a bit. Um, from what we've seen so far on those catalysts, there's nothing really standing out. I did like the the new Bloodrust Aegis, um, which is the int ward per second, and now it has uh, ward retention on it as well. Um, I do use that on a few ward-based builds. I find it quite good. Um, Armor changes, don't really care about too much. They're just shifting stuff around. Like, they've, they've done this in the past. And cool new wraiths, which is awesome. Uh, the Gambler, right? So the Gambler is only up to item level 40 now. Uh, this is pretty big because while you would never get your endgame set of the Gambler, he was just so good for getting a set up and running, right? So, like... You, you know, you're you're hitting like 70 to 80, right? And you're like, man, I, I need to like get my gearing in order. So just going and buying like a bone amulet because the implicits are so good or uh, whatever, you know, like your engraved gauntlets or, you, you know, items with very good implicit bases. That was really important. And now you're no longer able to get this. However, we have so much more access to specific exalteds now. So... I think there's just like a big gearing step that's just not going to happen anymore, um, which is that like well-crafted rares. So um, that like a middle step where we're going well-crafted rares and maybe a few exalts here. We're basically just skipping over that and going straight to like really good exalteds. Um, but then again, the new dungeons may help assist with that particular gearing process by giving you just so much loot to choose from. Um, this is really good as well because now we do have a gold sink that uh, gold is scaling with corruption. I think this is pretty important. It, there should be reasons to do high corruption and currently there are very few reasons to do that. Um, so we don't know what the scaling is like, but it you know it gives me a lot more confidence to do like 500 plus corruption, right? 
um, and gold drops above 140 corruption will be slightly higher before. So that's the tipping point. Uh, so yeah, we'll see how we go. Um, I like this charge, this change here, the uncommon affix shards. So they'll now be like colored slightly different to the common affix shards. Um, one of the suggestions that I was going to put forward was that, um, well, okay, so an ongoing discussion is that every single person who seems to come into the community is like, what, you know, why, why do I need to manually send my shards to my forge? Why can't they just automatically do that when I pick them up? And the dev response has always been the same, which is just like, we want shards to basically, be, you know, treated as an item that you pick up off the ground that you care about, right? Um, so what I, I thought is that it, it's good to find uncommon affixes such as like plus level of this or, you know, whatever it is, right? Um, but it just gets drowned out by the millions of common ones you get. So if you were to look at a way that you could say every single common affix shard um, was just one thing, which is just like a common affix shard, and it, it's no longer like a vitality shard or an intelligence shard. You just have common affix shard and that can just mold to whatever you want it to be. But for the uncommon or very rare ones, right, you, you would need the specific ones. And I think like, you know, this takes a step in that way. And I would love to them to take like another step if they want to stick by their convictions and not just send affix shards to the inventory straight away. So the, the forge straight away. Uh, eight uniques that drop randomly. We'll find that out soon. Um, so when I'm next streaming, I'll probably have a look through that and give my initial thoughts. And then we're getting some more. I believe these will be linked to the arena of champions. And when we see more arena, oh, sorry, more champions coming into the patch. Um, awesome three D models. Always love it. I think it's it's important. Um, if there's one I'm looking forward to. Probably something like the Eternal Eclipse or um, the Tyranny's Biden. Uh, you know, I have some builds that I just like playing with those. I think, uh, uh, you know, that, that's pretty cool. Uh, but there's like some pretty cool ones there. If you've got one in mind that you think, oh man, this is going to look awesome when we see the 3D version of it, just let me know. Okay, the roll range. Uh, that's that's a nice change. So basically, like some of the roll ranges on Uniques wouldn't show up. So now they're all going to show up. All right, kind of onto the juicy bit here. So Bastion and Olana, a notoriously good shield, a shield that was so good that it was basically an auto include um, as it made your build so much stronger defensively in every build that could use it. So if you have like a two-handed weapon, where you really need to dual wield or like you really need a catalyst, you would use those. Otherwise you would just use the Bastion Honor. And and for someone who like a side play Swarm Blade, right? Um, it makes sense for my build to dual wield, but seeing the progress of my arena runs on a dual wielding versus a Bastion of Honor, it was just so much clear the strength of a Bastion of Honor, even though it thematically did not fit with my build and made no sense. So having the less damage taken from nearby enemies nerfed um, and is now just like health gained on block, which is still like an okay stat, right? Um, it's it's not like a game-breaking stat, but you know, it, like it does something. Uh, th this is a good change. I think it's probably like where it should be nerfed. Uh, and then, you know, increasing the rarity because it is a bit of a chase item and then drop with less legendary potential because it is so powerful if you can get like a 1LP version with block effectiveness on it. Uh, Calviner's Claim, aka Clownover's Claim, is nerfed with the um, the Druid Transforms. So this is good. This was um, something I experimented with quite a bit in the last patch. I basically just said, look, this is way too OP. It's just so strong. It's an awesome technology. I like the idea of it, but it's just abused so much. It was like kind of okay for the shaman, which, you know, you're just kind of like really just cheating out mana. So you could use expensive earthquake style abilities. But then you look at the druid passive, which gives you two seconds of 70% damage reduction after leaving a transformed state. And it's like, oh man, that is, that is too powerful to work with this item. 
because you could basically just roll through all three transform states and have a permanent 70% damage reduction, as well as the mana cheat aspect of it. So this is really good to see. Uh, I I'm happy that this is the way it's addressed because the item, or well, the Calvin's claim was really the only issue with it. Um, but I, I think the Druid passive will also need a look at in the future because there are also ways to quickly pop yourself out of form. Um, really nothing going on with Ingvar's. Uh, Ravenous Void. Okay, so this is a hot topic. The Ravenous Voids have been gutted in some aspects, but they are still really strong. And I'll, I'll go through the reason why they are still really strong, right? So the, the big line, and some people will have missed this, is that um, you are going from 5% less damage taken generically in the previous one, so there's no aspect there, to only void, right? So this only affects void damage, um, but it affects it a lot more because now you can get 6 times 6, which is 36% damage reduction for void, uh, combining that with up to 75% physical damage taken as void, so both physical and void benefiting from the less damage reduction, uh, just not... Uh, the usual 5% less damage taken overall for everyone. And the reason why that this is good is because physical and void are two of the most dangerous resistance types in LE. So it's like, oh, it's only two out of seven, right? But it's like two out of the top three, and those three are so far above the rest. If you've pushed high in arena, you will realize that fire, physical, and void are the most likely ways that you will die. Um, poison can get a little bit spicy because of your inability to avoid it in some circumstances. Most necrotic damage is completely avoidable and doesn't hit that hard. Probably the worst defender for the necrotic damage is the Soul Cage's uh, breath. Um, but like fire, physical, and void are like the scary things that you can't avoid that deal high damage, that even like minor stuff will stun you. Um, lightning and cold just don't live up to the same expectations. Um, so having DR on the most threatening damage types is still very valuable. So that is good. Um, the other thing is that you are now have like 20% increased health at a max roll. And significantly more likely to drop legendary potential. So when I read this, I interpret this as if you are able to get like a few ravenous voids, a patch by target farming it, and they are still super rare, right? So, I mean, I, I don't even have a pair of ravenous voids, um, but like I've kind of given up on, on farming it because I'm kind of like past the point in which I should have expected one. Uh, but like... This means that if you have a character and you play a lot, you could get a one LP Ravenous Voids now, and that doesn't seem completely unreasonable. And if you now look at Ravenous Voids, not just as like the base unique, but like a one LP version of it, you've got 20% increased health plus a maybe exalted hybrid health. You're going to have like 28% increased health plus like almost 100 health plus the, the base 10 vitality. It is so much health that it increases your EHP dramatically, dramatically, right? It's not as good as this, but this was so busted before that it was just astronomically good. I still treat a regular Ravenous Voids on the same level as a well-crafted um, exalted gloves with all the affixes you want. So once you look at like, like maybe like a tier 22 sealed with like all the affixes you want gloves, that would probably be better than a ravenous void. Um, but the one LP version would be better than that. So like, unless you have perfect gloves for your build, ravenous voids are going to be the best. Um, Obviously, if you need like a unique gloves, whether the frostbite shackles, whether they are the um, like wing guards or salt the wounds, you have to use that, and and you probably would have used that in the past. But if you have that glove slot open, ravenous void is still the way to go. It's still so strong.
don't believe people's lies when they say it's like gutted. It's it's still a very very good item. Um. Okay, so most of those are fine. A slight nerf to frostbite shackles. I don't think this was necessarily needed. I think the issue was primarily with gas bars, which is addressed further down. I don't know why that's just down there and not up here. Um, but for whatever reason, this is now like 33%. And I think this hurts builds that aren't, that are frostbite and not mage, because mage is the only one that actually has access to frostbite duration. Uh, everyone else has to basically rely on the role of their frostbite shackles to get good duration. That can be a little bit harsh because you like when you're an ailment build, you want to make sure that you have access to all the buckets, which include both duration and effect. All right, um, some nice little changes here and there. I'm, I'm not going to get into this. It's mostly the same. Uh, I like to see the optimization. That's good. Get onto the bug fixes. Um, so anomaly is fixed, which is good. Well, so the the time wave stuff. I I've tried this in the past, and it looks really cool, but it just didn't do anything. And I was like, why is it not doing anything? So it turns out it was highly bugged. So I might try that again. Um, the Prob yeah, here we go. Flurry has been taken down to where it should be. Maybe. It may still be too strong. So the, the, the force waves aren't subjected to the less ailment chance of flurry. That's been known about for a while. And when you look at the ailment application of high poison stacks, right? Or even a high bleed because bleed's quite strong and rogue has a decent amount of support for it um you were getting like a lot of value out of it and then this was why flurry was deleting things from the game because when you had the most ridiculous attack speed in the world and rogue has access to so much attack speed right um it was double dipping and it just means that like your damage with attack speed alone was exponential on a build that scales exponentially with attack speed. So that's why you're seeing like 50 million, like I, I think we saw like a billion damage ticks with poison and this combined with this is the reason why. So um, from a numbers perspective, I, I cannot comment on where Flurry will land. I still think it's going to be super strong in terms of its damage output, but it's never been a great ability for survival as a one, it roots you in place, and two, um, that rooting in place, you also lose the best rogue passive, which is less damage taken while moving. So the best rogue builds defensively will typically be ones that are always moving. Um, some fixes for Thorn Totem I'm excited about because they've got a few Thorn Totem builds in you know, waiting. Uh, this is good. So previously, if you had less than 20 rage when you cast Maul, and if you'd taken Skullcrusher, what it would do is that you would start jumping and then you get popped out of form and then you would stop jumping. <laughs> and I reported the bug on day one and they're like, oh, I'm not sure if it's a bug. It was definitely a bug. It was super annoying and I'm glad they fixed it. No more Mimi Primal Scorpions pulling Lag on into the center of arena. RIP. You will be missed. From there, I, I can't really see too many um, things that were like standing out as quite obnoxious in the, the meta. I don't think some of these were well known amongst the community. Um, so yeah, I'm interested to see what this means. Um, so the low priority settle is basically like when you cast an ability, uh, like let's say you cast an ability and you can cast ability once every one second, um, the low priority se um, settle would be a, a percentage of that. So if you cast it at, at like the zero second mark and at the one second mark, maybe like the low priority settle was 60%, which means that like 0.6 of a second, right? 
you could start moving or using movement skills. And then at the one second mark, you could recast your ability, which is like why I gave you a, like a forced stutter step if you were just holding down a button and also trying to move. So um, I think this could be a nice little fix from the way I'm understanding it, but it, it it's a bit technical, so I'm not going to get too much into it. Uh, passives, apparently not a lot of changes to passives. It's good that Dark Rituals is fixed. I like that. Um, one thing I expected to see was the, the nerf to the Necrobomber build that I put out, which is the Dreadshade Zombies interaction as well as Zombies Ward. It's been busted for so long. The, the, the Zombie Ward's been busted since Zombie came out in 8.2. The Dreadshade loop has been busted since it got fixed in 8.4. So 8.3? 8.4. 8.4. Um, so... I thought that this was getting fixed. It's not mentioned further down the track, so we'll, we'll see. Maybe it's gotten stealth nerfed. Uh, not too much in terms of items. I think that is basically it. Um, here's the, the other one, right? So the gas bus inside giving increased freeze rate multi. Um, I'm glad that this is getting fixed as the guy who is notoriously no one for doing frostbite builds. It just sucks having frostbite as this just thing you can slam into almost any build that hits often because you, you used like freeze rate multi, snow drifts, frostbite shackles, gas bars, and you just did damage, right? I, I proved that with a shaman build. <coughs> um, just how strong that can be. And also like... On my Frostbite um, Swarm Blade, I just felt like I was giving up so much in terms of stat budget of a helmet. You know, I'm not getting Vitality, I'm not getting Tunement, I'm not getting increased health to run this thing, which just tripled my damage. It, it felt really bad because I could not improve on that item and it started to chew away at my defenses, but obviously, like, the damage increase was just too important. Dun, dun, dun. Some enemy fixes, which are good. I uh, always like seeing stuff like this. Improve the hitbox, help the leap slam. Died to that just today, so <laughs> can't wait till tomorrow. Um, but that is it. So thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoy it. See you in the patch 8.5 as of tomorrow. Um, looking forward to everything and, and testing out some new things. Uh, and seeing what the arena champions will be like. Anyway, till next time.